My name's Dave Peters. I'm the lead coach at Rumble Fitness. Last year we worked on a documentary breaking down the goals that I set for the Nats Challenge, being four laps and completing it under six hours. In a world of pain. On. This year I'm going for five laps. I think it's really important that you hold yourself accountable to a goal or to, you know, even just within your training that you are accountable in your training. And, and I think it's a massive part of goal setting which is left out, that people look at a goal, they set themselves a target and they don't necessarily have any kind of time phasing on that target or any kind of speci specific um, part of the goal which really means that you've got to hold yourself to following a certain programme or following a certain line of training to actually succeed. And without the accountability side of things, you're going to struggle to really improve and succeed at the level that you want. You know, you, it's not to say that you can't improve with just a, a roundabout goal, but actually if you haven't got something of real credibility that you're measuring against, you're going to struggle to draw the best of yourself out. And the accountability side of things will make sure that not only is that goal set properly and that you can really set yourself a challenge which is genuinely going to get you to what your, your main outcome target is, but it's also going to set you up for ensuring that the way that you go about achieving it is done effectively as well. It's freezing. All right. So, uh, how many weeks we got now? Five. So I think five weeks until nuts. As you can see, it snows here, which is always nice. Obviously, it's perfect training weather for what we're doing. Um, I get run over. So dropping into the barn, we've got um, John coming down today. So John's also coming to nuts, and he's um, he's going for four, I believe at Winter Nuts and um, we've been breaking down some of John's goals and we've been looking at some of the things he struggles with because over the last year he's made some massive improvements but he's still struggling with some of the bits and pieces so things like the nunchucks and things like that he's still struggling with so I've put him into a bit of a routine and we've given him an idea we've set him some goals and I've given him a time time scale to work to but he's not absolutely convinced that he's going to be able to do that so what we're going to do is we're going to bring him in I'm going to work with um, work with some drills for him, show him some techniques and just sort of try and change his perception a little bit as to just how short actually he can make them progressions as long as he puts the work into the right things. So giving him a time scale that he might feel is a bit unrealistic but I don't believe it is. I believe if we do these drills we'll get him into it and he'll be able to benefit so yeah we'll get him in. It's a little bit warmer inside than it is out here so we'll see how we get on with it and then uh, yeah see how we go come in, it's a little bit warmer. Let's do it. So with your nunchucks, yeah. if you're struggling with them at the minute, yeah. can you, you can't grip them, or you can grip them each, but as soon as you go to move, you struggle. As soon as I go to move, I, in fact, just gripping them. Yeah. Right. I hate them. Now, when you do your sideways rings, yeah. yeah you, yeah. Do you miss the ring, or do you stay on the same one? I haven't tried missing one. Um, I normally just um, go from ring to ring, sideways. Yeah. Two hands on, on the same one. Right, and when you do it, do you do it all through swinging? Or do uh, you do it by crabbing and holding up? No, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So the, probably the issue for you or when you come to nunchucks is that if you're only used to swinging, yeah. that swinging technique, if you like, on the nunchuck does work. Yeah. I actually personally find it a lot harder than, yeah. I think if you're a kid, yeah. or if you're a lighter or smaller person, yeah. quite often the swinging is the way that you've got to do it. And usually it's because of a range thing, yeah. so that their range is shorter, so the swing will minimise how much distance they have to travel across things. Yeah. Does that make sense? But also I think when you're heavier, I think it's too, you're too compact, you're too tightened up in the arms when you're at a lengthened position. Yeah. And your lever is too far away for the weight that you've got, your strength to weight ratio. Yeah. Whereas if we can pull you in a bit closer, whether it be a lock off or higher up, but even if it's just 
I tried and moving it into it. Um, and that's the only re that's the only way I've done two nunchucks. Right. Uh, but that's the maximum I've ever done. And now, yeah. So for you, there, there will be an element of that that is going to be a strength side thing. So we're going to have yeah. to keep doing the strength training to build you up to it. Yeah, yeah. Because this style of doing it isn't necessarily the most efficient way, but it's all about getting it to a point that you can do it. We can build your volume up, yeah. and then you'll be able to actually get some volume into your training, and then you'll get more options. And then if you have to swing for it, it won't be so much of a problem because you've got the momentum. So your way of doing this, or on the other wings, would be probably, we'll find out, but I guess over that, there, yeah? Okay. I'm not doing that. Or, that's what I'm doing. That. Yeah. Which is okay, and the principles is the same in terms of the swinging technique on a nunchuck. Yeah. But what you haven't got is a nice overhand grip, downward pressure in the in the, in the wrist. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You've got that yes. kind of yeah, it's a different grip there, and then one above the other as well, yeah. not side by side. So it's a different yeah. a different grip altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your wrist is able to work there a lot better than it is there. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what we need to do. We need to start getting you used to working in this position. Yeah, like that. So spending some time on the nunchucks, hanging. just spending practice hanging or yeah. pulling into it, yeah. but just getting the hands used to it is great. Yeah. But until you get to a point where the volume of that is useful, because mm. it's like it's all well and good. It's like when people say to do dead hangs, oh yeah, let's spend time doing dead hang. But if you can hang for one second, yeah. it's like well, it's not going to do you any good getting up yeah. and doing twenty times one second. Yeah. So you almost need to build the strength. So what I would suggest you do is start to get strength. Yeah. of the pull and this, what I call an M&M &M movement. Okay. Right? So what you want to do is you want to imagine your body, you're pulling in and you're transferring across in an M across the rings. So you want me to do right? that on them? Yeah, because you're going to be more familiar with the grip. Yeah. You're in an overhand position, yes, so you're not specifically training here, yeah. but what we're training is the movement pattern, not the grip. Right. Okay. So you're going to do your grip training by working with your nunchucks, yeah. by doing your kettlebell swings, your barbell work, all of that. Yeah. But you're going to practice this movement because I believe that the movement on the nunchucks you'll find more natural. So what you're going to do is you're going to practice being there, but you're going to pull in, in and then over. You see how I'm lifting into it? Yeah. That's what we're looking for. Out. Yeah. So I'm grabbing and I'm joining and I'm grabbing and I'm joining. Because again, you see my hand position when I work, I'm trying to work one above the other, yeah? Okay. Rather than side by side. So I'm on opposite sides. Can you see that? Right, yeah. Just practice two or three at a time. Don't have to do hundreds. Let's just give you a couple of attempts and just see how you feel with it. So. Good. Just keep that M&M's. Up, up, up. Good, one more. Good, relax, not too bad. That didn't feel too bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, obviously. But it didn't feel too bad, but it's a totally different game when it's your hands are like, like that. Well, you say that, the only, it's not totally different. The total difference is the hands, but actually the movement is very, very similar. The movement, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. what you've got to get your head out of is, we're training this for the grip, we're not. Yeah. We're training this so that the movement of that M&M &M movement that I'm talking about yeah. becomes natural to you. Because then when you start to build the strength from the hands, yeah. and we say to you to do an M&M &M movement on the nunchucks, yeah. You now don't need to focus on what that movement is, because yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. You will need to just focus now okay. and make sure the hands are there. Got it. Just go across that again and try and make sure there's a real clear bounce. Use the knees, that's it. Good. Keep working, keep working. Keep working through it. One hand above the other. <coughs> go on, you can do it up and over. One more. Good. Individually, all of us have got our own knowledge and our experiences and we can all kind of sit back and take those from previous races, from previous training, from previous successes that we've had. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what challenge we've set ourselves, we'll always kind of have something to fall back on. Not many of us, you're only a beginner once. So there's always that element that if I've been to nuts once, twice, three times before, I'm always going to use that time and that experience before to, to really direct my training. But that doesn't mean that I would only solely rely on myself. And also, if I'm looking at this from a, from a wider perspective, if I'm looking at this from, a, from a, a Joe Public point of view, if you like, why would I want to do that? You know, I've got experience and knowledge of the course. I've got experience and knowledge of training. That's my job for a start. But in terms of actually succeeding, I've got to seek it out 
the experiences of others. I've got to look at the wider picture because I've got the experiences that I've been through, but there's no guarantee that that's going to be how it is on the day. And I think there's a similar concept when you talk about training in general. You know, it's, it's a bit like with Rumble, with when I'm talking to people about why they should come and train, to, train with us. And it's because, you know, no, it's not just a knowledge thing. There is a knowledge element there. You've got to seek out the best knowledge that you, you can find. You've got to do your research in terms of technique and skill sets and things like this when you're going to try and improve in something like obstacle course racing. But actually taking that knowledge and, and experience that from other people, it's like taking another step up the ladder without having to go and experience those situations for yourself and therefore only be able to learn from it that way. If you can take those experiences from people that are seasoned in those areas, if you can go and take the knowledge from people that are, it's their job, it's their responsibility to be educated in that area, you shortcut your way to, to, to a higher level straight away. Do you want to try it on end, just see if it made a difference already, just trying that approach to it rather than the sweep? I think I know what will happen is I'll, uh, I'll get onto there and then I won't be able to move. Yeah, maybe, because, yeah. That's what I'll happen. Is that a confidence thing though that you're going to just let go as soon as you go to? No, it's not that. It's, um, it's a grip thing because I'll be slipping. As soon as I get on there, I'll, I'll be slipping. Two hands. Yeah. Well, we'll have to see, won't we? Yeah. The other thing as well is, is do you use chalk when you do this? No. So there's this massive taboo about using chalk in obstacle race, and everyone's, oh yeah, but you're not going to use it in a race. Yeah. Well, you're not. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're not in a race. We're training you yeah. to get you stronger for when you go to races. Yeah. And that, that whole concept has to be seen completely different. Now, I'm not saying you come in here and you lever up with chalk everything you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're trying to get around a new skill or yeah. a new element which requires a little bit more strength that you haven't quite got yet, yeah. but you're working towards it, what's wrong mm. with putting some chalk on, getting a little bit of assistance for you to get some practice and some sort of volume into your training right. and then over a course of a couple of weeks start to take that chalk away yeah. and then you would have had some volume okay. to add. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So rather than seeing it as, oh we have chalk, we don't have any mason, well no you don't. Mm. But we're not looking at you to do all your training chalk either but what we are trying to do is it's no different than starting when someone first starts lifting a heavy barbell, mm. we might suggest that they wear a belt. Right. When they first start lifting heavy, they start lifting, they get used to it. Yeah. Once they get used to it, we might say, we don't need the belt this weight anymore, you only need the belt for a heavier weight. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? And then they would take the belt off again, use their own core again a lot more, and work that way. What you don't want is loads of powdered chalk where it's just going to just be yeah, not yeah. going to absorb into skin loads. Yeah. The reason I say liquid chalk is better because it's got that moisture to it. Yeah, so it's straight away it starts to absorb into the skin, not just sit on the surface. So when you go climbing and you use climbing chalk, yeah. quite often it would just go, you go out and it would just. Yeah, lose it's on, it. it's, it's, um, there's a film on your hands, yeah. which is what this stuff gives you. Yeah, it? basically. And we're not talking layers and layers, we're just no. talking to try and change the surface just, textures. Just around the um, On your hands, yeah. The contact point. Yeah. So all we want you to do is you can almost start there, right? Okay. Set a little bit in your weight there. Yeah. That's it. Squeeze like hell out of your hands. People, I know that's it sounds what, obvious. That's what I know. I don't do Squeeze it. like hell because people often go, oh, I can't grip on nunchucks, and then they just got this. Oh. That's just what get up there and, and properly squeeze through the hands. The chalk will help a little bit with the moisture, but let's just get you really working. And think about the other that we just did, right? Right. Hang. So, so hang some of the weight in your legs, right? Your left hand's going to join above your right above. hand. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So you're going to hang a little bit of weight in the hands. Jump up, and as yeah. soon as you carry momentum forwards, take that right hand to the next one. Carry straight over, straight over, good, and again, and carry to the wing. Now relax, good job. That chalk helps. Yeah, all right. So you say the chalk helps, obviously it does, it's yeah. gonna help too, need some of this thing. But look what you've just done, you've just gone cross lunchups. So now in your training, yeah. you've just doubled your yeah. ability to practice, right? Never come across so you go again. again. Again, you do it again, you do it again, and see how many you can get in. Because now, you're fighting the eccentric, yeah. the lowering out, yeah. you're getting the hands used to it, again, focus, squeeze that hell, yeah. get the hands to work, move straight away, yeah. follow, as soon as you get forwards, straight off again with the right hand. Got and it. just see if you can get across the second time. Right, same system, so hang the weight down, jump to the first bit, get that left hand up, squeeze that hell and get the right hand up. Again, M&M good, up, and then relax. 
See the difference? I don't think I could do a third one. No, maybe not, but you've just done twice as many as you normally yeah. do in your training. Yeah, and this is what I'm saying. Like, so if you start to spend some time now in your training here, yeah. here, yeah. here, yeah. yeah, and vice versa this way, yeah. just hanging. Just hanging. But also, I'm not a huge fan of the hanging. I think yeah. hanging's great for building endurance, but actually, you know, this isn't specific, is it, to what you're doing? No. no so, you're not moving, you know, yeah. realistically, Really, you want to go to that? Yeah. Jump and pull up. Through. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah? That's, that's what I need. Mean. These are drills that you can do because you're going to get the movements through the arms, through the body, yeah. in the way that you were going to use them. Yeah, yeah. Once you start nailing that technique, yeah. your hands start to become used to being on here, yeah. on the here. Yeah. You can start to look at swing techniques through, just like you talk about the rings. Yeah. And then once you've done that, that's when you're so familiar that you start to build the strength that you start coming around. I'm not sure that's going to happen. That doesn't happen for me, but <laughs> it will happen <laughs> some, you know. When you talk about being realistic in the targets that you have and the goals that you've set, you kind of hark back to experiences that you've had before and, and maybe the future aspirations that you have for the ones that you're going for. And, you know, people will ask the question, what do you learn more from? Whether it's success that you've had previously or the times that you failed it previously. And honestly, that's a really difficult question to answer because it's almost equal in my mind. You know, the success that I've gained kind of shows me that I can do things and I have done things before and I can enhance the, <laughs> probably not the best word, I can enable myself to do things that maybe I didn't think were possible, you know, and I can take all of the confidence and I can take the experience of those events and put them into the next ones. But again, it's actually probably the failings that have given me all of the knowledge and experience to be able to do that in the first place. So without those two things, sometimes it's not as clear cut as success and failure, especially when you start talking about hitting your peak level, you know. We're all at different levels, I've talked about it many times, that we're all on a different level when for whatever it is, you know, my level is probably four laps. That's probably where I'm at, at this current point in time. So for me to step outside of my comfort zone and, and now say, okay, you know, let's move up, let's have a go at five and let's really apply myself to going towards five. I think I'm gonna to need to rely on the success and the failures. And not just the success and failures of myself, but of other people as well. Because this is, if you're really taking yourself out of your comfort zone, then it's something which realistically, you're gonna need success and failures that you can learn from, not one or the other.